Join us as we take a look at the development of the visual arts in Dayton and the Miami Valley. Meet the people and the organizations who created this diverse and thriving visual arts community with their passion and a vision for art. Photography as a fine art has been uh, an important part of the Dayton Art Institute program since 1930. From the 1930s, we were teaching photography in the school, uh, not just the technical aspects, but as a fine art. Uh, in the early days of uh, Sigford Wang being director here, he was very much interested in photography, and he recognized that we had here in Dayton uh, an internationally known photographer. and so. In those early 1930s, he started having small shows of photography. And one of the photographers that he uh, felt was very important for us to have because she lived and worked here in Dayton was Jane Reese. Uh, Jane Reese started her photography career in 1904, and she worked on very actively in the field until 1944. Could have gone on longer, but her eyes and hearing by that time were impaired. Jane Reese was born in Zanesville, or near Zanesville, Ohio, and it, she developed uh, some problem with her health. I had thought it was uh, TB, but I think it was spinal meningitis. And uh, she was sent down south, to apparently to some relatives maybe, maybe in, I think it was North Carolina, for her health, because they didn't think she'd maybe survive. Well, while she was down there, uh, someone loaned her a camera, and she became so intrigued with the camera. She had been doing some painting before, but due to this problem with, I thought it was um, with her health of it not being able to breathe, the turpentine and the oil was getting to her, and she couldn't do the painting anymore. So she did this uh, photography. Jane Reese established her studio and residence in an abandoned old firehouse on Riverview Avenue in Dayton. With the help of local architect Louis Lott, she refurbished the structure into a salon where she rented space for concerts and exhibitions. Hermine and Josephine Schwartz gave dance classes in the upstairs studio. They were her neighbors, friends, and subjects of many photographs. She went to the Clarence White studio in New York. Somebody was able to underwrite her going there for a little while. I think the NCR uh, was some of the people were responsible for helping her out with that. And um, he, he felt that her technique and what she did was so unique and so unusual that he had her show his classes some of the things that she did, but did not make her conform to the way that he was teaching other students. So uh, she was in New York for a while and did some unusual work there in New York, and we feel she was influenced by the people like uh, Stieglitz and, and um, Steichen, who were in New York, and I think she was there at the time of the Armory show, and I'm sure she was always in, uh, influenced by what artists in other fields were doing, and also what other photographers were doing. And then when uh, uh, Dr. Esther Seaver came here, uh, Miss Reese was up in years, and she was concerned. She always thought her collection of photography would go to the Dayton Art Institute, but she was a little bit doubtful when a new director came on. But Miss Siebert immediately recognized the importance of Jane Reese and of her photographic collection. So in 1952, uh, she assigned me to go over to Jane Reese's studio every morning during the summer to work with Jane Reese to get her collection of, photography, of photographs together. Uh, one day, uh, Ken McAllister, who was helping uh, mount them, as he had the local uh, supply store here in, in Dayton and was helping uh, frame hers and mount her photographs, went over, and Jane was tearing up her prints off of the mounts and throwing the mounts away. And we said, oh, don't do that. You're showing all, throwing away all the recognition, all the labels of the shows all over the world that you've had. Oh, well, she knew which ones they were in. But we were able to retrieve them and add, add those to the uh, information that we have on Jane Reese. 
In 1952, Miss Reese gave 390 salon prints to the Dayton Art Institute. Many of the prints had been frequently exhibited and had received numerous awards. Ninety-nine of the prints were autographed portraits, and many were of famous personalities. An exhibit titled The Camera, the Paper, and I was mounted by the Art Institute to mark the event. But Dayton's world-famous photographer may be best remembered in this quote, by her friend, Catherine Pinckney. She was just a mite of a person, almost bird-like in her quick movements, as agile as a monkey, and with quick darting glances like a chipmunk through tiny bright eyes, eyes that saw more from memory and close observation than a 2020 vision. That vision that had served her so well began fading in her 80s, but the rich vistas of beauty which her eyes had seen and her camera and memory preserved, enriched her life and that of all whose presence she touched. Jane Reese lived well into her 90s. The studio still stands today at 834 West Riverview Avenue, and her photographs remain a part of the collection of the Dayton Art Institute. <laughs> The city of Dayton was founded in 1796 in a valley where five rivers converge. The city prospered and grew to become the Dayton we know today. As the city grew, its look, its character, its visual art became defined by its architecture and those who created it. I think the period that I would define as the beginning of Dayton's golden age for the uh, building and planning arts really began in the last part of the 1880s. Um, and this was primarily a result of, uh, of a growth spurt for Dayton and um, our feeding into the expanding markets in the West and being a feeder market uh, into Chicago and a couple of things going on in the construction arts field. One was the development of elevator technology and steel and construction technology um, that really started Dayton's golden age of skyscraper buildings um, that continued on uh, into the 1920s. Um, there are a couple of things that you really have to consider when you're thinking about this period of time, too, uh, because there were a number of national trends having to do with design, arts, and architecture and building. Uh, but what makes it really interesting locally for Dayton was matching this up with architects and developers and there's um, one interesting thing that I think we can pick out here that uh, started on South Ludlow Street and actually started in 1908. And it was the teaming up of Albert Pretzinger, uh, who I would categorize as being one of uh, the most important top two or three architects uh, in Dayton at that time with a local real estate developer by the name of Adam Schantz. And uh, Adam had begun to do uh, some building projects on South Ludlow Street, the first one being the commercial building uh, at the northeast corner of 4th and Ludlow, which today is actually part of the uh, arcade complex. And um, these, two, these two men got together, and Adam Schantz was an eternal optimist, and that's going to be important to remember through all of this. Um, but they decided they were going to uh, sort of reflect their optimism in design with the Beau Arts architecture, so to speak. And uh, there was quite a bit of Beau Arts architecture, and it was really uh, a carryover from the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, which took place in the very early 1900s. And um, the Beau Arts movement was really given uh, life at that exposition, and it was very ornate uh, architecture. And in our town, uh, these two gentlemen teamed together and um, expressed it through a lot of ornate terracotta, uh, terracotta type detail. Um, there are a couple other interesting things, not only uh, that were going on at that same time, and Dayton also being the a manufacturing center and a place where a lot of invention and innovation was occurring. Uh, there was what I consider to be uh, very interesting uh, developments with industrial architecture. Uh, and some people might even say this is modern architecture because it was not ornamentation. It was really machine age architecture. 
and we had some uh, really wonderful examples being the entire NCR complex, uh, most of which does not exist today, but that was all designed by Frank Andrews, who also designed uh, the American building, which still stands today at the corner of 3rd and Main Street, and the Beaver Power Building, which is a bare-bones concrete frame building with industrial uh, type steel sash windows with some um, uh, what I would call almost art deco ornamentation cast into the concrete up uh, on the corners that had been constructed at the northwest corner of um, 4th and St. Clair Streets. There was great civic optimism in Dayton after the 1913 flood. In general, the 1920s brought with it a period of great optimism throughout the entire country. Great success in business created great wealth. People felt a personal responsibility to give back to the community some of the wealth they had gained. This was expressed in the engineering arts, with the building of beautiful bridges throughout the city, causing some to call Dayton the Venice of the United States. In the building arts, civic buildings, such as the Dayton Art Institute, were constructed. Miss Linda Clatworthy, a former Dayton librarian, was the catalyst Dayton needed to begin a successful organized art movement. In 1912, she helped form the Montgomery County Art Association, which flourished holding exhibitions at Memorial Hall, Reich's store, and the Delco building. By 1917, the name was changed to the Dayton Art Association, and its first painting was purchased. It was at this time Mrs. Julia Shaw Carnell became interested in the activities and aspirations of the art group. Well, Mrs. Carnell uh, was interested in the development of an art association in Dayton for a long time along with a number of other distinguished citizens or Wright, for example Mr. Kettering and Ms. the Stoddards and others but uh, her own background was one that uh, perhaps is associated with her first husband uh, who was one of the two Patterson brothers, uh, whose names are associated with the National Cash Register. You see, you had John Patterson, who was the great promoter and uh, so forth, and then you had Mrs. Carnell's husband, who was the man who really produced the cash registers and made things run. In 1919, through the efforts of Mrs. Carnell and others, the group was able to purchase the Kemper property at the corner of St. Clair Street and Monument Avenue. Incorporated as the Dayton Museum of Arts, the new museum grew rapidly, adding an art school and hiring a director. A circulating gallery was created and funds were raised to improve the property and to purchase artworks. In 1923, the name was changed to the Dayton Art Institute. Dayton already had had from Mrs. Carnell the promise that she would provide a building. And uh, in fact, uh, the committee had asked her to uh, help with a $500,000 building that they were going to build if possible. And she said, after she uh, knew that she was going to scare them, she said, I don't want to contribute to that $500 building and the poor things were really uh, uh, in dismay. She said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you the building. And then she didn't keep her mind exactly as far as the uh, 500,000, because she put a million 300,000 into this building. And at that time, money meant something. And as you know, we have a very precious building. Architect Edward B. Green was hired. He designed the building to reflect Mrs. Carnell's love of Italian Renaissance architecture and modeled it after the Villa d'Este near Rome and the Villa Farnese at Caparola, Italy. Work began on the site at Forest and Riverview Avenues in the spring of 1927. The cornerstone was laid in a ceremony on May 21, 1928, 
and the Dayton Art Institute opened to the public on January 7, 1930. Now, when the building finally came into completion and was open, at the opening, she said something that I'm going to read from this little card for the simple reason that I want to get it right. She said, I want the Art Institute to be a friendly place. I want you to come again and again. I feel like I am giving you one of my children. Treat it kindly. That was a beautiful statement. Siegfried R. Wang was hired as director of the museum. As a graduate of the University of Chicago and a student of the Art Institute of Chicago, he had assisted the sculptor, Lorator Taft. He was only 24 years old when he arrived in Dayton during the construction of the new building. In a history of the Dayton Art Institute, Catherine Pinkney wrote, any hour of the day and some of the night, his six-foot frame could be seen dashing about the incompleted building, striding over paint buckets, scaling the unfinished stairs, ducking under scaffolding to plan where this sculpture or that painting would show off most advantageously, meeting and joking with workmen, conferring with decorators and board members. He brought to his work an illimitable enthusiasm and vitality which has not diminished in his many years as director. Now, Mrs. Carnell had made it clear that she was not interested in just having a row of pictures around. She wanted it to be a vital thing. And as a result, any, anything that could happen that would add to that vitality was very important. Although when Mrs. Carnell gave us this building, there was practically nothing of terrible importance in the collection here. There were a few things. Um, she had purchased a nice little fountain figure, Farnsworth. And the, there were a few paintings of charm. Otherwise, it was material that was being loaned. Uh, Mr. Thresher had invented one of the trustees, you see, had invented the idea of a circulating gallery where we borrowed paintings from dealers and from artists and we'd loan those out to any member who had a ten dollar or more membership and they could keep them a month and then bring them back and so forth and we had interesting experiences with that that was a very popular thing and many of the schools used the the circulating gallery during mr wing's term as director the Art Institute was known as Dayton's Friendly Living Room. This term was coined by a visiting French archaeologist, and it suited Mr. Wang's desire to humanize the museum. One popular feature which he started was a small animal zoo on the museum grounds. It began with the gift of two Indian blue peacocks and grew to include cranes, antelope, and two miniature donkeys named Coke and Cola. It was not unusual to find a thousand people at the museum on a Sunday afternoon enjoying the art and also the animals. The Carnegie Corporation had been willing to give us what was then the best equipment for getting good classical music and given us 1,500 uh, records to work with and break eventually, of course. Today that equipment would be very sad, but at that time it was the best. And it was surprising how many people enjoyed that. One time, I remember walking into the gallery and seeing a whole group of students sitting on the floor listening to classical music. And I remember one of the dowagers of the town uh, happened to be with me, and she looked and said, Is that dignified for the students to be sitting on the floor listening to that music? And I said, I am grateful to see those students in any condition if they are getting something from the music that we are providing. And another time, I remember coming into the building and seeing two of the uh, flyers from Wright-Patterson Field sitting 
in two of the comfortable chairs that Mrs. Carnell had provided, listening to the same type of thing, listening to the music. They could choose their own records, you see, and play them. That worked out very nicely. The Dayton Art Institute became a cultural focal point for the arts in Dayton. In June 1933, the Dayton Philharmonic Orchestra gave its first concert in the auditorium of the Institute. The Dayton Civic Theater was organized and housed on the museum grounds in buildings that no longer exist today. One, one of the ventures that, that we were especially happy with was establishing a modern room. By that we meant here was a room where if Mrs. Glotz came and didn't like what she was seeing because it was too modern, she would still be reconciled to it being there because we have said from the start, these are the men who are doing experimental work and important work in America today, and we are delighted to be showing them. I consider perhaps a very high point in, in our whole exhibition program was being able to bring to this museum the famous Whistler's Mother picture that is so adored by young and old when they go to the Louvre and see it there. It had been loaned to uh, the World's Fair, Chicago, and it had to go back. And so we got in touch with the proper French people, and at first they weren't too enthusiastic about letting him come to a little town like this. But um, they, they were very cooperative, just the same. And eventually they said, if you insure the painting for a million dollars when it's here and have an um, armed guard, we will let you borrow it for a month's time. So we did it. We got it. And many people enjoyed seeing that great masterpiece among the arts of the world. Now, we had the good fortune of raising money to get a man in armor. Uh, he was mounted on a horse. He was purchased from the Metropolitan Museum. Fortunately, Mr. Phillips, who was the head of the decorative art department and in control of the arms and armor area, had been one of the, my fellow students when we were at Harvard together. And he told me that they had a horse and man armor that had stood on the floor of the Metropolitan Museum for 20 years. But the horse armor was not made by the same armor maker that the man's armor was made of. That didn't make any difference to them for 20 years and made no difference to me. And he said they'd be willing to sell it here for $6,000. We went about it by trying to get the kids to put in their nickels and dimes and so forth because we knew that the children we brought it here so they could see what they were trying to buy. And as the youngsters got very excited about having that beautiful man in armor on his horse, um, some of the adults chipped in a few dollars. And the Metropolitan Museum people, especially Mr. Phillips, were so excited about what we were doing with the kids that they said, get $3,000 and we'll forget the thing. They did. The arts, to me, are all inclusive. Your dress, your hair, I don't care what you do, the choosing of a ring or a bracelet, are part of a bigger program making your life richer and making richer the person who happens to look at you. And you're the work of art. Now that goes right through then to whether it's a piece of ceramics, a plate you use, or a very great piece of sculpture. If you have gotten acquainted so that that piece of sculpture is a friend of yours, instead of being the name that you can barely pronounce, that man made it and he did it and okay. That's a way above my head. Just like with great music. Some of the loveliest mu music in the world is not difficult music. It's very melodious. It's very lovely. Uh, if through the contact of the experiencing of those things, 
the child or the adult can have a richer life because they can take in the joy of the music, the painting, the bit of ceramic, what have you. That is a reason for having an art museum and for having an art museum that wants everything. And that's what we did in the spirit of Mrs. Garnell.